Okay, last time we were together in numbers here, we went through the Korah fiasco, where Korah said, just who do you think you are? And we recognized that 250 other guys came alongside him, talk about having a bad day. Moses wakes up, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day, comes around the corner, and here's this entire rebellion of all these religious leaders that coming in and saying, who do you think you are? And then we recognize not only was there a Korah fiasco, not only was there rebellion amongst these priests, but then even the people turned in them and said, what are you doing? All you're doing is bringing death. And God said, if that's what you want, that's what you get. And the Lord just struck them with a plague and 14,700 died. Remember? And so everybody's kind of going, aye, aye, aye. And here we see God, as we said last week, God has a plan. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that anything with two heads is a freak. We have headship in the families. We have headship in the ministries. We have headship in God's plan and purpose. Not for authority, for authority's sake, but for guidance, direction, and protection. Amen? Amen. And we look at that, and we see that, and there's a very important thing for that. And we, we as a society struggle with this. We as a society are so into my rights and my freedoms and my opportunities and what we deserve. And can I just remind us all right at the beginning that what we deserve is death. That's what we deserve because the wages of sin is and last time I checked, don't get offended, I'm in a room full of sinners. How can you say that? Well, because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if you are in that all category, then guess what? That's you and me. I am not perfect, you are not perfect. That imperfection the Bible calls sin. Some folks have an issue with that, but I just want to say that it's that imperfection is that will cost us eternity. Because heaven is not a good place, and thus good people don't get to go. Heaven is a perfect place, and only perfect people get to go. And we're only made perfect by the blood of the Lamb. You following me? So if he's got a purpose, if he's got a plan, if he's got salvation, then the people need to know about it. And God's got an authority. He has a direction for the thing to go. So what I want you to jot down in the beginning before we go into this is basically chapter 17 is about God giving the nation his children, that's important, God calling the nation, his people, and he's giving them a tool, a sign, so they won't be fooled again. So jot that down. This chapter is about God giving the nation a tool or a sign that they will not be fooled again on leadership, that they will not follow a false teacher, a false direction. They will not follow charisma. You know how many times I've heard people, as I'm listening to the, our country move towards the elections, and people are saying, I like so-and-so because he or she has charisma. Well, if you've checked your Bible, so will the Antichrist. Amen? Amen. He will win in all different kinds of personality contests and so on and so forth. And so because someone is in your age group or someone has personality or somebody has this, that is nowhere near the reason why we ought to throw in our hat. We see here, a nation was fooled. The people went after the 250 who followed after Korah and said, hey, we deserve just like what God is giving you rather than saying, hey, maybe God's got a purpose and a plan and I want to be faithful what he's given me. And so he gives them a tool. Notice now verse 1 of chapter 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and get from them a rod for each father's household, 12 rods, From all their leaders, according to their father's households, you shall write each name on his rod. Now, again, the problem was leadership. Moses, who do you think you are? We're all equal. We're all Levites. And God says, no, 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 you're grumbling against me. These things come out. So God says, all right, I need to help these guys out. I need to make it clear that I have anointing and persons that I am going to lead to lead my people. And so what we're going to do is you got the 12 tribes. I want you all to go get your rod. And bring that rod before me and put your name on it. So each one of the leaders of the 12 tribes were to come in and bring the rod. Now, where would they get this rod? This rod was handed down. This was like the heirloom. This was the the mantle. This was like the crown, in a sense. This actually does come from an an Egyptian custom that they would use in such a way. And so they would have, if you recall, maybe if you've ever seen the movies that they would have, so let it be written, so let it be done. You know, that same kind of thing where it was a sign, a symbol. And so that staff that he would carry, that rod would be a symbol of this is the person who is the head of the tribe. Now, it's important that you recognize with me tonight, I think the Holy Spirit has a lot of parallels for us in this chapter. And one of the first ones is to recognize that another name for a rod, a staff. And so every one of these leaders was to bring his rod or his staff, and he was supposed to bring it before God and put a name on it. Now, what would happen next? Verse 3. 
and write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. Meaning Aaron, I recognize, is the head of the Levites. For there is one rod for the head of each of the father's households. Verse 4, you shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. Now, what am I supposed to do, Moses? I'm going to take all of these rods, all 12 of these. Some scholars think 13 because of Manasseh and Ephraim. And so the separation of the two and thus all those 12 plus um, Aaron's not necessarily mattering, but they're to take all of the rods and they're now to take them and place them inside the tent. So Moses is given permission to come inside the tent of meeting, okay, into the tabernacle and bring them and place them right before the ark. Okay, that's what he's called to do. Now, why? Verse 5 tells me, and it will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will what? Will sprout. Now, didn't I not just tell you that these things have been passed on? So these are old sticks. This isn't something that's freshly cut. These are old sticks, walking sticks, the staffs that you see constantly being in use. He says, and it will come about. I encourage you to circle that and highlight that. Whenever you see that in the Bible, get excited. Because when God says something's going to come about, guess what's going to happen? It's going to come about. And here's what I want you to, the first point of the sermon tonight is this. When God says something's going to happen, and it does happen, start jotting those down in your Bible. I, my whole Bible has these marked up, fulfilled, and I can go back to verse 6, da, 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 fulfilled, to put down the date, March 14, 1948, fulfilled. And da, da. Why do I want to do that throughout my Bible? Because when I see God said it, and it did, God said it, and it did, then when it comes to promises in my life, I can trust Him as well. Amen? Whenever I come across that which I don't know, I can fall back on what I do know. And God is faithful, and God keeps His promises. When he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, that means he'll never leave me nor forsake me. If he says he has a plan to prosper me and not to harm me, he's got a plan to prosper me and not to harm me. Are you following me? It's important. And so here he is saying this, and it will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus, I shall lessen, notice, from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. Now, he's talking to Moses and Aaron. He's saying, listen, I want you to just make it clear so these people will stop grumbling. Because they're grumbling against you. But when they're grumbling against you, who are they grumbling against? God. As I told you before last time, you know, this is a tough passage sometimes to preach. Because it might sound like it's self, you know, elevating. And it's not. But I'm the first person to tell you in every single sermon, I bring in some place where I'm the cheese bag. But the point of the matter is, is that God says, these are the people whom I've called. And maybe I know just what you need in order to continue your growth, your walk, because I'm going to give you this kind of pastor or this kind of person or this kind of father, this kind of husband, because I know exactly what it is that I need to be fleshing out in your flesh. Hmm, quiet room. And that's what the Lord is doing. And he's saying, I'm going to make it really clear. But let's not move too fast from verse 5. What does this chapter about? It's about God saying, I'm going to make it clear who my leader is. By what? I'm going to give you a sign. What is the sign? A rod, a staff is going to sprout. Are you following me? Okay, then let's go to Isaiah. Keep your finger here. And let's go to Isaiah, if you would. Please join me in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Isaiah 11, verse 1. Isaiah 11, 1 says this, Then a shoot will spring out from the stem, or if you have the King James Version, the rod of Jesse. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And it goes on and on as we can and then connect it with Isaiah 55. Who is this speaking about? Help me out here. Who is this speaking about? Jesus. So here we have this prophecy. He says that How are you going to know who the Messiah is? That he will come from the rod of Jesse. He will sprout. He will come forth from that which seemed to be dead. It will come alive. And this will come back. Now come back to our text here in number 17. Because here we see this first sign that God is saying, how are you to know 
who the true leader is. How are you and I as Christians today? How were they, if he is the same yesterday, today and forever, how were they to recognize a true spiritual leader? How are you and I to? The answer is clearly you need to recognize them by their fruit. Is there a blossom? Is there fruit in this individual that would give any sense that it is not a position, but it's a calling? Amen. That is what he's saying here right now. Now he says, I'm going to give you a sign. And this sign that you can know this is the person to follow is that you will see fruit. Now with we seeing that, we see the prophecy of Jesse. Now go with me to Matthew, a scripture you're very familiar with. Go to Matthew chapter 12 and join me at verse 4. Verse 40, excuse me. Matthew 12, verse 40. We looked at this just a couple weeks ago. If you remember, the Jews sought for a sign. And this is where he says to them in response to the sign. But he answered them, verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, what was to be the sign? The sign was is that, you know, you want a sign? I'll show you what the sign is. Is that that which is alive will be dead and it will be placed then inside the tomb and three days later it will blossom. It will come back to life. Amen? Amen. So, you think there might be something coincidental here? Something connected here that we need to pay attention? Guys, you see, like the resurrection, here we take these dead staffs. These dead staffs are placed inside before the Lord. And then the next day it comes out and it is blossoming and alive. That which was dead comes to life. That was the sign of the authority, the mantle of God, the leader that God had in store for his people. And you see, that's what we see here. The same thing. The uh, the rod came alive and it came forth. And the first miracle is wonderful. The second one is life changing. Amen. And that Jesus Christ went in as a dead rod into the tomb, dead, and came out alive. A sign. He says, I'm going to give you a sign. What is that sign? That which is dead will come alive. Now, wait, if we understand that, let's move on. Verse 6. But Moses, therefore, spoke to the sons of Israel, and all of their leaders gave him a rod apiece. For each leader, according to their father's household, 12 rods with the rod of Aaron among their rods. Verse 7. So Moses deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of of testimony. I want to stop right there with this situation. Verse 7. Why do we get to verse 7? Well, because chapter 16 tells us that there was a whole lot of drama going on. You following me? There was a whole lot of hoo-hoo and new-hoo about who's doing this and da 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 and grumbling and who are you trying to... And look, everyone's dying because of you. Dying because of me. You guys were the rebels and da 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 and all this stuff was going on. Where does God say that we're supposed to bring the drama? The sticks here represent, you guys are all in this whole big fight. Where are you supposed to bring it? Notice verse 7. It says it very clearly. So Moses, and I love that. My version says deposited. Now, I know you guys with the NIV and others have the word placed. But I love the word deposited. Moses deposited it where? Yeah, but what's it say? Before the Lord. I would encourage you to underline that or highlight that. Where are we supposed to take our drama? We're supposed to take it before the Lord. Don't get on the phone. Get on your knees. Where are we supposed to do, what are we supposed to do with it? And I love that word deposit because I don't know about you guys, but that word deposit, I clearly understand. That's you go to the bank and you put it in and it takes it from you. It's gone. You know, poof. They're holding on to it. It's no longer in my, I've deposited it. And yet I wonder how many times we're like, here, Lord. And maybe tonight you might be in that category once again of one who's saying, God, how come you haven't? And he's saying, because you haven't let go. What can I do until you let go? If you brought your broken toy to your dad and you kept holding on to it, he could never fix it. And you see, here we see God saying, hey, you know what? When we're having struggles with what's going on in the leadership of our family and our household, our school or this, where am I supposed to bring this uncertainty? I'm supposed to bring it before the Lord and drop it. Deposit it before the Lord God Almighty. So critical, so, so important. Now, verse 8 says what happens once they did so. Now it came about. I have that underlined in my Bible because it connects with 
Verse 5 said it will come about. Verse 8, now it came about that on the next day that Moses went into the tent of testimony and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi, notice three things, had sprouted, put forth buds, produced blossoms, and bore ripe almonds. Now, this dead stick, can you imagine that? He's coming in like, dude. It has blossomed. It has the flowers that are open. If you've ever seen the almond blossoms, amazing beauty. And then it even had the fruit. It went through all three seasons right there in one night. So any agri-girl person, anyone who was a, a person like these folks were who were farmers, here they come in and they see this thing and it's not just one night, but all three seasons in one night. Here it is. And it was dead. It was a stick. It was walked on. Can you imagine through the desert all the time? Stomp, stomp, stomp. There's no way the water could have come up in the middle of the night. Sorry, Mr. Dawkins, anyone else who's a skeptic. The stick was dead and now it's alive. Why almond blossoms? Some of you might recall. Let's go to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. When God is describing each of the articles of the testimony that go inside there, there's a particular very important piece of furniture. Join me in Exodus 25 at verse 31. It says this. Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand and its base and its shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. What kind of bulbs and flowers? Verse 32. And six branches shall go out on its sides. Three branches of the lampstand on one side and three branches of the lampstand on the other side. Verse 33. Three cups shall be shaped like what? Almond blossoms. You might want to cross-reference that for yourselves now. Almond blossoms in the one branch and a bulb and a flower and three cups shaped like almond blossoms in the other branch, a bulb and a flower. Exactly what happened to the staff. The bulb, the flower, the blossom. What was the menorah? The menorah was the symbol of what? Light. And light was the symbol of what? Anyone other than Tim in the room? (laughs) We talked about this. I know it was a little while ago, but come on. You guys have studied the tabernacle many times. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a guide or a light unto my path. Light illuminates direction, leadership, ability to see. You want to follow somebody who knows where they're going. It's not, hey, follow me. I've got a blindfold on. That's not what, don't you feel so much better when you go on a trip when someone's already been there? I mean, like those of you that have never been to Vanuatu, I'm sure it makes you feel good. Okay, at least these guys know where they're going. Rather than, hey, get on a plane with us and we'll see what happens. <laughs> what should I bring? Lots of money. If we get in trouble, we'll just buy our way out. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. When you know someone has been there, when there is a guide, when there's a direction. And so the light represents thy word because thy word is a, is, is a guide. What is the word? The word is Jesus. In the beginning was the word. The word is with God and the word was God. That word became flesh and dwelt among us. Leader, blossom. You see what I'm trying to say here? They all circle together that you cannot come to any other conclusion than Jesus is God. Jesus is the leader of my life. The sign is that he was dead and he rose again. Amen. So who, who illumined your day today? Who was the light? Where did you seek refreshment? Where does that which was once dead, maybe something in your life tonight needs to die. Maybe you've got a relationship that's going that's completely not God honoring. And yet you're too afraid to let go of it. You say, Lord, I know what I'm in is wrong, but at least I know this. I don't know what you're asking me to step into. The point of the matter is, is looking. Who can I trust? What needs to die? Let it die because God's going to bring what is dead. He'll bring something altogether new and alive. And he'll bring blessing. When we can do as God calls us to do. And that's where we're going to go with this short little chapter. We're going to continue to hone this through. But why the almond? Why is that the symbol that he chooses to use? It's not exactly the biggest fruitful tree. I got an avocado tree that has much bigger fruit. Why the almond? Well, because in that period of the world, the almond blossom is the first to blossom every single season. And so it is a Jewish symbol of God's faithfulness to his promises. 
You might want to jot that down. The almond is the symbol of God's faithfulness to his promises because it's the first fruit to blossom, the first flower to come forth every spring. And so you know they would come out and they would see the almonds. They'd say, ah, once again, Jehovah Yahweh, he is faithful to his word and he has blessed us again with crops and we will eat this season. God is good. And that is why the menorah has the God is good flower all over it. Because God is good and God is lighting my way and I'm going to trust in his light and his illumination. I'm going to trust the Lord with all my heart. I'm going to lean not on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge him because he's going to direct my path. How? With the light of the world because Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Am I making any connections for you tonight? All right, good. At least Tim and I are in there. All right, cool. Yeah, all right. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll call this the Tim study. Okay, now. All right, now. The next thing you need to know is, I love it. I love it. all right, now go back with me now, if you would, to Exodus, I mean, excuse me, Numbers, in number 17, as we go on, verse 8, let's just read it now in its context, verse 8, now it came about on the next day that when Moses went into the tent, now imagine now, he walks into the tent of testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds. Verse 9. Moses then brought out all the rods from the presence of the Lord to all the sons of Israel and they looked and each man took his rod. <laughs> you know when you stand there and it's that sticks pulling time? You know and it's the short one is the winner? You know, and you're going, dit, 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 dit. and when that last one goes, oh, I got the short one. You got yours. You're kind of like, <laughs> you know, I can just imagine those guys like with their little, their, their little sticks. Mine didn't blossom. <laughs> Mine's dead. <laughs> it's kind of that Charlie Brown Christmas, you know, I got this. And that Charlie Brown Halloween, I got a this. I got a Snickers. You go, I got a rock. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like, and, listen, and you can see Aaron, I got all the blossoms. I got a stick. I mean, there was no question whatsoever. A, a miracle happened and God had spoken. Amen? Amen. And God had clearly clarified this to the people. So now here's the thing we need to understand. We can recognize those to whom we are to follow, listen, and submit. Let me say that again. Church, Christian, we can recognize those whom we are to follow, listen, and submit to. By the symbol that God has given to us in this text. And that is fruit. What is the fruit that we are to see? Hopefully you're not looking for an almond blossom coming out of my head. But it's the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Now I know my staff is saying gentleness. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits. This is the element of the fruit of God in a person. Now, here's my point. Mom, dad, husband, staff, are you wishing that you had more of an impact on your child, on your ministry, on your home group, on your bride? Well, then maybe the key is not beating them with the rod, but letting them see the rod blossom in your life. Letting those around you to whom you are called to guide, letting them see your life bear fruit in the fruit of the Spirit. And the only way that I see that that miracle happened is two things. Number one, something had to first be dead. And number two, it had to be brought before the Lord. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Guys, I don't know what it takes, what needs to die tonight. You single guys, start now. Start now figuring out what it really means to die to self, die to every single desire. Are you fasting at all once a week? Because as I've said before, fasting is one of the greatest spiritual principles. Why? Because it teaches me to tell my body that it is not in charge. God is. We all say God is large and in charge, but I can't stop eating Twinkies. God is large and in charge, but I need that coffee every day. God is large and in charge, but don't you... Uh -uh. We need to find what is it that I have in my life, be it surfing, <gasps> whatever it is 
that my body, my life would show the greatest vacuum and I need to be able to say, Lord, it does not control me, you do. And it's not for God, it's for us. And you see, men, if you can start doing that now as a single guy, then as you find that time when the Lord brings your bride, I don't know how many single guys are going, Lord, why am I still single? Well, because you're still a nut. God is still at work because, you know what? I've teased a lot of my brothers who are single. Like, why am I still single? Because God's protecting her. (laughs) Because is there the discipline that I am going to be the one who is going to seek his guiding light? Then you will be able to guide someone because your bride will see the fruit of the Spirit of God upon your life. Parents. Do your children see you praying over them, laying hands on them, seeking the counsel of God on what to do when it comes time to discipline? I know my mom did all the time. Lord, give me strength. (laughs) Lord, give me mercy. I want to kill that boy. I saw her seeking the Lord and half joking, but half serious. And I recognized that she was under authority and thus I needed to be under her authority because she was seeking the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit. You see, too often people think authority is the carrying of the rod. No, it's letting the rod blossom. And then they'll follow you to the amazing depths. Again, not to embarrass him, but I have the, few, the privilege that many men do not have and that I have a Jonathan and David relationship. And I don't know how many times Dave Blevins has said, I got your back. I'll take a bullet for you. I'll do whatever it takes. Most pastors, when they leave, they don't necessarily want an elders meeting without them there because that's in the past where things have gone kind of crazy. But in our church, I'll leave and say, you guys keep meeting. Why? Because if Dave's there, then I know I'm there because he's got my back. You see, understanding what that's about, that kind of love, that kind of relationship comes from dying together, watching blossoming happening together, coming before and depositing ourselves before the Lord in the tent of meeting. What do you do when it's sing time? Are you thinking about how, how loud waxer claps? <laughs> Are you thinking about how loud so-and-so next to me sings and I sure wish they wouldn't? Are they thinking, am I singing too loud? Are we thinking, man, I'm sounding good tonight. (laughs) Are we recognizing this is deposit time? Because the last song that we sang tonight, and I didn't talk to them about it, was the twofold song. Lord, empty me and fill me with you. Seems to be the message that the Lord has in store for us. You see, the key is that people will sense when they're around someone who's walking in the Spirit. There's not a time that I have not been before Pastor Chuck. And many of you don't know who he is. But he is the pastor who started the Calvary Chapel movement. When you come around this brother, you know that this guy has been on his face before the Lord. I sense an intercessor and a prayer warrior. And that makes me just say, dude, let's do it. I want to come alongside someone who I know is seeking the Lord. Does your wife know you seek the Lord? Do your kids know you seek the Lord? Does your staff see it blossom in you? Very important. When someone claims authority over you, look for the fruit. Now let's go on. Verse 10. But the Lord said to Moses, put back the rod of Aaron. He brought them all out. Everyone's like, whoa, I got a stick. Now what am I supposed to do? But the Lord said to Moses, put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony and keep it as, what's it say? A sign. You see, God says there's going to be a sign, guys, I want my leader. And keep it as a sign against the rebels. Meaning there are always going to be those who are going to raise up and question your authority and what you're trying to do in God's name. Let this be a sign against the rebels that you may put an end to their grumbling against me so that, now notice, so that they will not what? So what is the sign for? The sign is for their protection. And as I said in the beginning of this message, it was important that you understood that God said to his nation, to his people, that would be us grafted in, understand Romans. He says, guys, I want to protect you. So I'm going to give you a sign that you will know who is truly the one to follow. And number two, within that, I want to protect you so that you will not die. Just think about it. 
I don't even know if even many of you in this room even know who Jim Jones is. But the people of Jonestown followed a preacher who was at one time very anointed, but then became very charismatic. And then there was no check and balances and the people no longer were able to discern as God is calling tonight. And it did cost them their life. They drank the Kool-Aid and they died. The people of the Hellbach Comet cult there in La Jolla, where the comet was coming by and this guy took all, I mean, brilliant people, doctors and lawyers and nurses and so forth. And all these people, they followed this very charisma individual, charismatic individual, and they took their lives. They died. But people die constantly, even spiritually. Today, I went to an appointment that I swore I would never go to. I went to a foo-foo hair salon. <laughs> because my wife was tired of me having orange hair. Every time I went to my friends and so on and so forth, and she said, you need to go to my guy. I'm all, girl, I paid 20 bucks and that's the tops, all right? <laughs> no, 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 you need to go to my guy. You need to go to my guy. You need to go to my, no, 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 no. And so I was like, okay, yes, I will come along. Husbands, wives, meeting in the middle. Okay, I'll go. So she makes this appointment. Last week, Wednesday, and I canceled. <laughs> and then they called and said, oh, we had a cancellation. You can come in today. I'm all, oh, gosh, all right, I'll go. I'm sitting down there with the guy. And of course, you know me, I'm looking for that window. Where can I shoot that window to get that conversation going on the Lord? So I'm sitting there talking with him and da, 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 da. And I get my key. I see my slot. I'm Indianapolis 500. I see it and I'm taking it. And I step on the gas. And I say to him, so... What is your background in regards to faith, religion, or Christianity? And he says straight up, he says, well, my grandfather was a very strong Catholic. But my parents, they didn't buy into it at all. My kids, all my, all my grandparents' kids, they tried to force it on them. None of them wanted it. So all six kids said, nah. But when I came around, my sister and myself we were forced to go to catechism. We went through the, kind of the communion, the confession thing, all this stuff. But even my parents didn't want to do it. They were doing it to please their grandparents. And then he said, and then we went to this one Easter service, and the priest just railed on all of us out there for not coming the rest of the year, and that we only came on Christmas and Easter, you know, the Christer comment. And he said, and I said, well, what's the point? And so I pretty much haven't been back since. And the Lord just gave me a great opportunity I'm sitting right there in the chair and I said, well, you know, I'm sitting here because I've had a lot of bad haircuts in the past. <laughs> and, you know, that didn't mean I needed to stop getting my hair gun, haircut. I needed haircuts. And so it wasn't the problem about the hair. It was a problem with who was cutting it. And so I'm here underneath your blankety blank how much expertise I'm not telling you how much because I don't want to you know could have bought a surfboard okay anyways now um, <laughs> we got to put windows in the house what are you doing okay um, and he got it he got it I'm like I'm here are you going to say because I've had people in the past whose hair color turned me looking like Opie <laughs> that I should never go again. I said, no. I said, so perhaps maybe when you wake up every morning and you see that there is a sunrise and there is a sunset that there has in fact a God and maybe that God is trying to communicate to you and the problem is not the message, it's maybe been the messenger. I invite you to give us a shot. And the nice thing is that because of Kalo, I can say to him right then and there, I said, bro, you know what, tonight... Run at 9.30. Go to Channel 25 and take a watch. And just see. And see if God will speak to your heart. And see if God wants to minister to you. And reveal to you that he has a plan. He's got a purpose. Because I believe there's life, there's death. And I just quickly shared, gave him the gospel right there in the chair. While he's still got scissors in his hand. A very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> but I'm a man of bravery. You see, we need to recognize verse 10, that God is trying to protect us so that we will not die. He is trying to bring wisdom and counsel to the priest that, 
to the people that they will not die. What is Jesus saying? What is the point? What is the so what of these 10 verses that we have so far? It is simply this, and hear me clearly. He is saying, we bring out all the other sticks. You see, the other sticks are just sticks. Now take mine and bring it back in. God is simply saying this. He's saying, only my high priest, Aaron, only my high priest is the only way you people can be saved. By following where I'm going to lead him. What does Hebrews 10 tell us? Who is the high priest? Jesus. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Folks, it's not legalistic. It's not simplistic. It's protection. God wants to protect us from the funk. He wants to protect us from the cults. He wants to say, guys, it's so simple. It's just me. Just follow me. Follow the fruit and follow everlasting life. Amen? That's what he's got. And that's how he's got it set up. Now, verse 11, we can go on. Thus, Moses did just as the Lord had commanded him. So he did. Once again, that's why I like the guy. (laughs) He didn't try to make changes. He didn't try to compromise and say, hey, I got an idea. What about thus? Moses did just as the Lord had commanded him. So he did. Verse 12. Then the sons of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, behold, we perish. We are dying. We are all dying. I swear, I'm glad Moses was their leader, not me. Verse 13, everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle, the Lord must die. Are we to perish completely? What is this revealing, guys? First and foremost, notice, I encourage you to put down 12 and 13 in the margin. This is a view of unrepentance. This is a view of unrepentance. How do I know that? How can I say that? Well, join me in Genesis chapter 4. Let's look back at Cain's response. Genesis chapter 4, I think it's verse 13. Let's go back there. Remember, God comes upon Cain after Cain did what Cain did. He kills his brother. God comes up to him and should have given him death, as we know. But instead, he gives him grace and mercy and gives him life. And then he says to him in verse 12, and when you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield the strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Verse 13, and Cain said to the Lord, my what? My punishment is too great to bear. Not my sin was too gnarly. It's my punishment is too great to bear. What do the people said? You're causing us to die. No, no, no. God isn't causing you to die. You are causing you to die by your choices. Tonight, if you are a person whose testimony says, where was God? God is saying, I've been here all along. Where were you? God is here tonight. Now, in many ways, I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe I can look to the camera for those who are on TV. Where are you? Because there's a house of the Lord that's waiting for you because you got to first die to self and then come in. And you see, here is the point. The people is saying this very clearly. Look at this. Verse 13. Everyone who comes near it says, we're dying, we're dying. I'm back in Numbers, excuse me. Back in Numbers 13. We see the same attitude as that was Cain. My punishment is too great. They say, everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle, underline that please, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord must die. And they say this, are we to perish completely? Folks, church can be dangerous. Amen? Amen? Church can be a dangerous place. It's the reason why many people I know avoid it. You see, there is in fact a death that is going to be required in coming near before God. You see, there is, it says everyone that comes near must die. There is a right way, a right time to come before the Lord. And it is only through his high priest that such a thing can be done. But the church itself, the church can be a very and often is a very dangerous place. Remember, Korah found himself in the pits. The 250 people found themselves on the hot seat as God struck fire from above. And the 14,700 found themselves plagued. Well, I do not see a Sunday as I stand up and teach and preach and often a Wednesday night as I come before you that I don't recognize by the Spirit of God someone who's on the hot seat. What we're talking about, the Holy Spirit is going, mm, zing. maybe a dad here, maybe a husband is recognized. Oh, you know, here I've been trying to claim authority. I'm the spiritual head, but you're a jerk. And you're not a man who's on his knees and on his face, not laying his hands on his wife and praying for it. And so you're claiming something that you have never even blossomed for. And maybe that's getting you on the hot seat. 
Church can be a dangerous place when the Spirit of the Lord begins to get a hold of us. It can bring fire. It can bring a plague. Some of us might be plagued tonight with the things in our lives, the burdens, the inconsistencies that we're doing. We might just have been in the pits because we're not living a life that's right before God. Church can be a dangerous place. Hebrews 4.12 tells me that the Word of God is a sharp, two-edged sword able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. A lot of us on the outside might look really good because we don't actually act out upon those thoughts. Can I get an amen? Uh Uh-huh. But the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he done. Ooh. Hot seat. Zinger. Church. Dangerous place. Dangerous. Hey, listen. A Bible study ought to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. The word of God has got to speak to us, strike to us. Why? Why is this so important? Well, I want to show you two scriptures that are very critical for us to recognize as we close tonight. Go with me to Luke 9.23. Luke 9.23. You want to be a disciple of Jesus? You want to be a follower of Jesus? Luke 9.23 gives me that requirement gives me the stipulation it says this and he was saying to them all if anyone good word to circle and underline because that would include us if anyone wishes to come after me let him deny himself take up his cross when daily Daily and follow me you want to be a disciple great it's not asking me to bless your life to bring you more things, more goods, and so on and so forth. Being a disciple is saying, you know, Lord, whatever it is you have in store for my life, though you slay me, I will praise you. Though you choose to set my hair on fire so the Egyptians will turn around and go, what's that smoke? God, you are large and in charge. You are all loving. And so, God, I am going to trust you with all of my heart, not just with my mind. Because there's times my mind is not going to understand what's going on. And yet, you know what, God? I'm going to trust in you that through the suffering, I will know that you are there with me. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. For when I suffer, I know how to comfort those who suffer. You see, you want to be a disciple? Great. First, know who the leader is. Look for the blossom, Jesus Christ. And then the second thing is, only way it's got to be dead it's got to come before the tabernacle but it's got to be dead you wish to follow after me pick up your cross daily and i know i've said this many times but it bears repeating the thing that i've noticed about the cross is that i can only do three quarters of it myself i can do these and i can do this one i need someone else to finish me off Who do you have in your life to finish you off? Quickly, all the married people had an answer. But other than that, (laughs) I meet with a fellow pastor Wednesday mornings. And we discuss, we encourage, we share things. And there are things in our lives that when they need, when they come up, they need to be crucified. And that needs to be done once a year once a month, or at least once a week on Sundays. What's it say? Daily. One more verse. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And join me at verse 31. Rabbi Paul understood this. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 31. I protest, brethren... By the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what's highlighted in my my Bible is, I do what? Die daily. Can we say those three words together out loud? I die daily. You see, that is where we're going to find the blossoms, the fruit. Let what needs to die, die. Bring it and deposit it before the Lord in the tenth of meeting and let him resurrect, not us. 
Let's not direct. Let's not correct. Let's just say, as the Lord commanded, so he, she did. And let's trust in the Lord and let him bring his fruit, his blossom, at his perfect timing. Amen? Bow with me in prayer. Father God, in this short yet powerful chapter tonight, we have been reminded, Lord God, of truly the crux of what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. To be a follower means there must be a leader. And so, Father, are we truly the followers when we are constantly giving you direction in our prayer lives, when we're telling you how things ought to be done, when we're questioning your very character on why you're allowing something to happen in our lives, oh God, please forgive us. Please forgive us. Lord, you know our limitations. You know that we are finite. You know that we function so much on emotion and feeling. And that is why you said the truth would set me free, not the feeling. And so God, I pray that tonight you would speak into our hearts And Lord, where some need to be comforted tonight by your presence, that you would never leave them nor forsake them, Lord, comfort them. Lord, for those who feel like they have just been beaten up and battered and bruised, Lord, may they recognize that it says that a bruise read you will not quench out, Lord God. You will not. That you are here tonight to bring your spirit, your comfort, your healing, your presence, your power. But Lord, may we also agree tonight, Lord, where there needs to be acknowledgement that Maybe we've been trying to co-lead our own lives, our own will and pressing it upon you. And Lord, we've agreed that anything with two heads is a freak. Forgive us, Lord God. Allow us to step back, to step down and to step in to the tent of meeting, to come before your presence and deposit ourselves to let go of our word, our will, and our way that we might receive. We might be able to retrieve out of that deposit your word, your will, and your way. Which according to your promise is going to be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Lord, I feel in my heart this evening that there are some who are struggling in that area of self-control. There are issues in their lives that are constantly being repeated over and over and over. And yet, Lord, you showed us on Sunday that we have a message of power, a powerful message that can be proclaimed powerfully by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And a spirit-filled life is characterized by one who's in word, who is in prayer. Who is constantly saying, Father, take my life and let it be holy, consecrated, set apart, cleaned. And so, Lord, we come before you tonight as your kids. And where there is the core of rebellion within us, God, may we seek it to lay it down and let it die tonight where there is the 250 that are bringing the wrong censors, trying to do church our way. Lord, may we lay those down and pick up the gold. Father, for the grumblers, I pray that we would sit back tonight and say, Lord, your timing is perfect. That we would heed not the counsel of Job's friends, but that we would hear to chapter 38. Do you know where I keep the snow? Do you command the sun to rise and to set as I do? Did you set the boundaries of the sea that it would not come any further than this? Father, into your hands tonight, those almighty El Shaddai hands, we commit our spirit to you. Take some time. Search your heart. Let's use this time before God and deposit what needs to be deposited.